welcome back to another episode of the Verde View Pod, an Austin FC podcast brought to you by KVU, the AB station in Austin, Texas. I'm Paul Livingood, Senior Digital Sports Producer. Brittany Flowers is now serving her Red Card podcast. She is not here. She's off. Um, but, you know, we always have, we got Jake Garcia here. Um, Austin FC forward Mackenzie Gaines. Austin Knight will join us a little bit later. And so for more previous episodes of the Verde View Pod, you can visit KVZ2 page under the Verde View Pod playlist. Jake, it's been a long time since we've recorded. Um, there's a lot that's happened. There's been three matches, Colorado, Houston, and FC Dallas. We'll dive into all of those. Um, very quickly, Colorado is 1-0 loss. Uh, you know, that was a game where a lot of people were missing um, for, the, for Colorado due to um, international duties and stuff. And it was a game that everyone thought that was very winnable. For Austin, so very disappointing on that front. Do you have any quick thoughts on that match? Uh, honestly, it was so long ago and so much has happened since then. Uh, I can't say that I exactly do, um, but it just kind of fits the theme of a roller coaster type season that Austin FC has had. You have a few games, well, actually singular games, uh, where there's an immense high and then all of a sudden mm -hmm. they come crashing back down to earth. Um, yeah. And it just, it just kind of reminds you of uh, what we're getting with this team this year. Maybe it's because it's an expansion team put together in the middle of a pandemic. It's a first year head coach. Uh, it at one point was the, the lowest uh, paid roster in the league. Um, and so like, I'm used to it. I, there's no more shock value to me now. Um, because it doesn't surprise me uh, when there are these kind of lackluster and letdown performances, which the most recent game against FC Dallas certainly was. The game against Colorado was as well. And of course, as you mentioned, squeezed in between there was a glimpse of what they can be at their best. Yep. So moving forward to that, uh, Houston. So that Colorado game was a midweek game. Houston was a Saturday game. Or no, sorry. Colorado was a Saturday game. Houston was a midweek game. Um, after the Colorado game, the questions became again, oh, can they, can they score any goals? Can they score any goals? Up to that point, the only games that they had scored any goals in was the Portland game. And then once again, this team has shown that when they do score, they can do it in bunches. Um, very early on, uh, Tomas got a uh, – they credited him with the goal, but it was technically really an own goal. Um, but he put the pressure on and, um, you know, essentially it was, it was his responsibility that, that finished off that play. Um, but so he got credited with the goal and then uh, he ended up scoring two goals. That, obviously his best performance of the year so far. Um, he was the man of the match. He was the MLS player of the week. Um, and so, but, and then Cecilia, or Houston got a red card early on in that game, which obviously is going to help um, with scoring on later on. Um, Cecilio ended up scoring for the third goal of the match. Um, this is interestingly enough, uh, even though the final score was three to two, Josh Wolf kind of mentioned that the score, like because they got the red card, it should have been way bigger margin than that. And so he was, it was one of those kind of wins where like a coach is disappointed, but like you're like, I'm happy I got the win, but we should have destroyed them. It was his kind of narrative in that game. Yeah, and, and honestly, I think it would have been inexcusable if they had lost that game because not only did they jump out to the early lead, but as you mentioned, they were playing up a man uh, for, for much of the second half. And so uh, I, I, for Austin FC, you're going to take a win any way you can get a win. And uh, for them to pull it out was incredibly important because if you don't get that, then you're really in the mumble tanks and you really have uh, the Twitter army going nuts and no one needs that at this point in the season. Um, so definitely good for everyone's <laughs> long-term sanity that they pulled that one out. Yeah. yeah Poch Pochettino played great in that game. Cecilio obviously uh, showing what he's uh, paid to do uh, as the highest paid player on the team. He now leads the team again in goals. Yeah. Um, it, again, as you mentioned, when they score, they score in bunches, uh, 10 of their goals this season, sorry, 10 of their 13 goals this season have come in three matches. So, which means on three singular matches, they only scored one. Um, and on the <laughs> other ones that they, they've scored multiple. So like, it's weird because these are professional athletes and you'd like to think they have the mental fortitude to, 
not be pressing at the start of a soccer game, but I mean, maybe that's, that's been the case. Um, once they get that one, they seem to kind of loosen up and, and play their brand of soccer. It, it, it's very noticeable to me that whenever one goes in, like their confidence and their swagger is just, it's tenfold. Whereas whenever they haven't got that goal, they play so wound up and so tight. Um, and it's just, it's much more, it's much more loose and relaxed. You can see people not trying to force or force the issue. Um, but so going out of the Houston match, um, both signings had been announced because scoring has been an issue that they had signed Musa Jite and Sebastian Driussi. Um, Driussi was here first and it was kind of like he got here right before the Houston game, but it was just a little too close for him to play. And so obviously all week long, um, Josh Wolf had mentioned that, um, he didn't like come out and say that he, that Drusy was going to play against FC Dallas, but he very much so alluded to it multiple times. Um, it was like, oh, we're excited to get him on the field, uh, blah blah blah. And so, um, with that, um, FC Dallas comes around another weekend game. This is a um, a road game in Frisco, and uh, they don't start or Josh Wolf does not start his. Uh, his three DPS, which was a very interesting, right. a very interesting decision um, amongst the fan base and people who cover the game. Um, but when I saw that he wasn't starting um, any of them, I, I did question it at first. But then I thought, okay, well, they've had a lot of games. It, load management makes sense. Um, you want to get your guys some rest. Cecilio had played more minutes than anyone on the entire team, um, and. In retrospect, he he I think looking back on it now, he said that he had been battling illness uh for a couple of weeks and he kind of yeah. noticed noticed it in the Houston game. So in the moment, we don't know that until after the game. Um, but so he doesn't start any of his DPs. Um, first half of that game, they did very well tactically, at least. It went into uh halftime at a tie. Um, and he said that Drusy was gonna play. And so I even tweeted at halftime, I said, Hey, it's Let's go. Let's bring out the dogs. Pochettino's not starting. Dominguez isn't starting. Jerusi's not starting. These are your best players. Um, in theory, they're your designated players. Let's unleash the hounds and let them go. Let them go eat. Um, coming out. And that's of not what happened. That's not <laughs> coming out at halftime. Same lineup. And I was like, interesting. Um, but he did make one very huge sweeping sub. It was like the 60th minute or something. He subbed in four people. He subbed in uh, Migas, Pochettino. Drusi made his debut, and then he subbed it, uh, subbed on uh, Nick Lima for Aiden Stanley, um, who at that point, he, he just seemed like he was kind of gassed and was just very tired, or at least it looked like it because they, um, they had a lot of success pushing down that that their right wing, our left side of the defense. Yeah. Um, and so, unfortunately, within two minutes of Cecilio getting subbed on, he had he had a bad play in the middle, lost the ball. They score. Um, and, oh, another thing that I, I wanted to bring up that I didn't put in our rundown, um, I noticed this. Um, how I want to ask you, how suspicious are or suspicious? Superstitious are you? Uh, I'm, a I'm a little stitious. You're a little stitious. You're a little stitious. So I found mm -hmm. this interesting. I don't know if you know about this, but I was looking in the uh, Austin FC official group, Facebook group thing. And I don't know this firsthand because I'm in the press box and I'm not in the stadium. And so this is the first time I became privy to this. But apparently most like most of, if not all of the times that Austin FC has gotten scored on at home, they've been playing that Macala song. And so, okay. so everyone on there was saying, like, of course, the second we start playing McCalla at FC Dallas's place, they get scored on. And so now everyone's thinking that it's like this McCalla curse. And so I want to get your thoughts on what, like, thoughts on that quote unquote superstition. Uh, the ghost of McCalla is real because I remember there were there were people who were disappointed that uh, Q2 Stadium wasn't just named McCalla Place. So maybe that's what's going on here. So here's the thing. Um, like to my core, I don't believe in curses. I don't believe in superstitions. I don't believe in 
and hauntings or, or any of that <laughs> stuff. Um, th- that's what I truly, truly believe. With that being said, I do think like when I'm playing sports or when I used to be an athlete, like I'm very much a creature of habit. Yeah. And so like, I fully believe that there was a direct correlation between like what I ate the morning before a soccer game, uh, the music I listened to the afternoon before a soccer game, the order that I put on my socks before a soccer game. Interesting. I, fully, one of those. I fully believe that, that those things like had a, maybe not a direct impact on, on how I played or how the team did, but at least a psychological factor on me. And so once I found like, you know, something that felt comfortable and that was leading to success, I was like, all right, what it's no stress off my back to, to keep doing this. Mm -hmm. So why would I, so why would I deviate from it? So, so like putting myself in the position of a uh, supporters group member in the stands, like this is currently their sport. This is the thing that, you know, they get up for on game day. Um, And so like, if I'm one of them, I'd be thinking like, this is, this is crazy. We should stop doing it. With that being said, with that being said, do I believe in, in the curse? No. Is it a real thing? No. Um, but you know, fans are irrational people and that's fine. There's nothing wrong with that. That's part of what makes sports great. So like, you know, if they deem it necessary to get rid of the Makala chant, then, uh, (laughs) I'm not going to lose any sleep over it. Yeah, I just thought it was a very interesting uh, little tip because I was just watching because I watched the the FC Dallas game um, on uh, on the stream um, and just listening to Adrian Healy and, and Michael um, call the game. And uh, first time I've only done that for a handful of games at this point. Um, but after the game, I I happened to see it wasn't just one person either. It was like a, a whole handful of like fans that are talking about like, oh like every time we play Macala or whatever we get scored on and I was like that's kind of, that's that's an interesting little uh coincidence but anyway I, so. I just I just like to think that like you know the players are so zoned in and in their own little bubble that they're not I'm sure they can hear yeah. like the the general hum and like the the ambient noise but I don't yeah. think like they're registering exactly yeah. what what anyone is saying yeah. i don't think um, it, i don't think it affects the players whatsoever it, it was just an interesting fan perspective that i was getting out of that along those lines though of just like the impact that fans especially soccer fans can have on a game because i do think there's um you know definitely something there especially compared to some other sports uh it was i can understand why the fans were so disappointed and that three five two formation with zero of the designated players in the starting lineup, I can understand their frustration, especially when it's put up against the backdrop of there is like an incredible amount of Austin FC fans making the trip for mm-hmm. an away game inside this stadium right now in Dallas. Like I, I want to say, I saw something that said FC Dallas had to at the last second brand the night as Dallas stars night to, to explain away, like why there was so much green in the stands. So like when you have that level of, you know, buy-in and support from a fan base, that's watching a team that hasn't been great. And then you're rewarded with a starting lineup that, uh, you know, is the B team at best. Um, it's not fun. Like, just like, you know, people who pay money to go watch a Lakers game and, and see LeBron is resting or a Clippers yeah. game and see Kawhi has load management on the docket for the evening. Like that sucks as a fan. With that being said, like the coach does have a responsibility to his team first and foremost. Yeah. And, and like, and I think Josh Wolf explained it in a way that made it make sense to me. Like if Cecilio was feeling sick for the past few weeks, if Tomas had just played two straight games of 90 minutes each, I get it. 
Like I, I really do. Like I understand load, load management at the mm-hmm. end of the day. I just think like the way he explained it post game left a little bit to be desired. I mean, I think he said something along the lines of, you know, we, we love our fans. We appreciate their support. Um, but at the end of the day, like we have to look out for the, the safety of our players. All that's great. And then he goes, we're certainly more thoughtful to making sure they're all right. And it's like, all right, man, like there's a way to explain load management that isn't condescending or demeaning to the fans. Because like, yeah. I mean, Austin FC fans are knowledgeable. And so like, if you just went out and, you know, explained, Hey, like these guys were running on fumes, they needed rest. Like, I think that's a perfectly valid explanation. But to say, like, we're more worried about their overall health than the fans are, it's like, I mean, <laughs> you are, but you don't need to say that. <laughs> yeah. Um, another thing or to that same token, the, uh, something I'm curious to see if this happens with this upcoming match or if um, having the week off will eliminate that um, is that um, Diego has played a lot of minutes um late like i mean so i mean he started i mean you can't you can't bench everybody um but he like he said um cecilio um was feeling ill for the past couple weeks and you mentioned that tomas had played back to back uh or that was something that he brought up was like tomas has played back to back 90 minutes um and i saw someone on twitter say something about diego playing a lot and i went and looked at his minute log and it's like he's played like 70 ish minutes a couple times but like it, it it dates back like seven or eight matches where he's played at least 75 minutes every single game and so i was like when i saw that i was like well if you're if you're doing this load management thing does that mean that that diego is next up on the docket to get rest um or you know they have a week off now will he start again because they've had a week off so i don't know what the case but i mean look at it right now so he played 90 minutes against dallas played 77 against Houston. He played 90 against Colorado. He played 90 against Seattle. He played 90 against LAFC. He played 90 against Portland. He played 90 against uh, Columbus. So, I mean, it's like, that's a lot of games in a row and a lot of miles on, on a player. Um, So I I don't know. No, I mean, that, that's a tremendous point. I, I just think that like both with him and Alex ring, I think it might be unfair to, um, you know, at, hold other players to that standard. Cause it seems to me like the two of those guys are just kind of built different. Um, <laughs> like, like they're, they don't have an off switch. They're kind of the energizer bunnies of this team. And that is their game. Mm-hmm. Um, like you would like for every player to be like that. Yeah. We, we, we're not around the team every day. I mean, I, I don't think Tomas Pochettino is like that. Yeah. Um, and so if, if you're going to, um, be sacrificing quality of play and efficiency by running him into the ground, I don't think that's worth it in the yeah. end. Rest him in that case. Yeah. So, well, um, that's all of the, um, drama surrounding the, the latest three games. Um, what well, so- one more, one more thing really quick, like yeah. for all, for all of the talk of this starting lineup. Like the starting lineup in the first half actually played well. They did, yeah. Like they, they they accomplished what they were trying to do, and that was to go into halftime scoreless, right? Yeah. Um, and, or and the, so or with the lead, ideally, but I mean, at yeah, least, at least scoreless. Yeah, but like the three center backs playing defense were stout. Uh, the five midfielders uh, kind of clogged up the lanes, and 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 like, yeah, honestly, like they should have had the lead because that Manny Perez opportunity in front That's of the great. block was a, was a golden opportunity. And they, pro- they got unlucky on two of Diego's free kicks. So mm-hmm. they, they probably should have had the lead, but I, I still think like when you put out a formation like that, the realistic goal is saying, let's get to halftime scoreless and then bring in the horses and see mm-hmm. what happens from there. And so like for as much criticism as that starting lineup got, uh, it actually accomplished what Josh Wolf was was hoping it would accomplish. I think you're right. The the biggest takeaway here is you need to pull the the plug on it at halftime, especially because Dallas was in the process of making adjustments too. 
Yeah. Um, and, and they saw, they saw what Austin FC was trying to do. And so, I mean, the best way to, to counteract an adjustment is to make an adjustment of your own. And I think yeah. uh, if Josh Wolf had a, a redo button, he would hit it. I think so too. That was really the, the biggest uh, critique from my perspective uh, was just, I, I think it would have benefited to, to put in um, the, the, the three DPs at halftime instead of waiting. But like, even, but like you said, even so, because of the fact that they played so well, I can also understand from his standpoint of like, we've slotted Drusy for 30 minutes. Our players played well in the first half. Let's stick it out a little bit longer. I get that mindset. I, I understand it. Um, but like, you, like you just, you, sometimes you gotta, you gotta just strategy, like let the horses out, you know, you know, that your best players are going to give you the best opportunity to score. Um, that was the only thing that I would get out of it. So, yeah. But, um, so obviously scoring has been a problem. Um, Drusy is su- supposed to help that. And then another player that, you know, we've been waiting on for a super long time was Musa Jite. He's been held up with uh, immigration, you know, visa stuff um, for a long time. And recording this on Wednesday, August 11th, um, he actually just got into Austin yesterday. Um, the fun, It was funny to me, and I sent it in our group text. It was like the fans waited at ABIA until one in the morning to greet this man. And it's just like, it's so funny and ridiculous to me, but I'm like, hey, more power to you. If you want to go wait, at the airport for a player, then I'm sure he really, I, I guarantee he appreciated that. So like, oh man, these people are awesome. Like you know, they're here to meet me at you know, yeah. past midnight. So th- I thought that was an interesting thing. Yeah. And I mean, I can understand like the, uh, the excitement to see him just because this has been in the works for so long. Mm-hmm. Uh, and plus like he's a, he's a highly touted young hot shot who's coming in to play a position of extreme need. Um, mm-hmm. I was going to ask you though, like just cause he's here, like that doesn't mean we're going to see him on the field really anytime soon. Cause yeah. he still has to, he still has to go through like quarantine and all the COVID protocols. He can't even work out with the team until a certain point because of those things. Yeah. Um, Then when he does start working out with the team, you have the whole fact of this guy hasn't played a soccer match since May. Uh, So he's, he's going to take some time to uh, get his legs under him and get his conditioning ramped back up. He's going to need to learn the system. Um, So like end of the month, maybe like as a best case scenario, Um, but we shall see. I can tell you that that this team is really going to benefit as soon as he finds his way onto the field. Uh, one of the things that I'm excited for is the, um, the debut of the D squad, as you so eloquently um, put it in the last podcast with Jerusi, yeah. uh, Gite, and Dominguez up top. Um, I think that that's probably, that's going to be the new A squad, as, uh, so to speak. Um, but with and so then another thing I wanted to touch on, uh, GTA's number ninety nine. Love it or hate it? Uh, I think I love it. Yeah. Um. What What's I, wrong I'm, with it? I, I so it's just a a non convent like you know typically yeah. non conventional yeah, yeah. number for a position like that. Um, it's like know. it's it's like when Yasiel Puig wore sixty six. Um. I'm here for it. Luka it shows Doncic to wear 77. Yeah. It shows, it shows personality. It shows, um, you know, not, not doing the same thing that everyone else does and defying norms and conventions. So hopefully, yeah. uh, hopefully that, that kind of personality is indicative of his creative style of play. Maybe. I mean, and then granted, the number nine is already taken by uh, Hosen, who is the, the the team striker that they signed to begin with. So who That's knows? That's a good if, point. To, who knows if he wasn't on the team, if GTA would get number nine or not? And then it's a double nine. So I yeah. Mean, but I still I, I like the the whole you know non conventional like numbers on on certain players. Uh, it kind of strikes me the same way of like seeing like a defensive lineman with a single digit number. Or something like that. Yeah. Like a defensive, yeah. defensive end is number two, and you're like, oh, that guy's beast. 
that guy that guy is as fleet as foot as uh Derek Jeter is. <laughs> <laughs> there you go. Um so he uh Jite and Drusy um, are obviously going, uh, hopefully going to help solve the scoring issues that have been very prevalent with this team. And another person that is supposed to hopefully uh, address those is another signing that we're going to talk to today, and that is Mackenzie Gaines. He's a native Austinite, um, played overseas for a little bit, and uh, so we are going to. Uh, welcome him in and interview Mackenzie Gaines right now. All right. Uh, we're welcoming him in, welcoming in Austin FC Ford, Mackenzie Gaines. Thanks for joining us on the podcast, man. Yeah. Thanks for having me. I wanted to open up um, just with, so you, you're, you're born in, uh, in Austin, correct? You're born and raised here? Yeah. Born and raised about uh, 15 minutes from Q2. Okay. Um, so you've obviously, you played for um, Lone Star. And we so did Kakuda, and so we wanted to ask you what that was like. And uh, we had talked about the fact that um, he's a little bit older, and so, but you grew up watching him. What was that like now that you play on the same team as him? Yeah, it's pretty cool. Um, obviously, as like a young player in an academy system, you look up to the older players, right? So, mm -hmm. I mean, what better role model to have than Kakuda? We also had a uh, Kyrie Shelton, who's now with Sporting KC, who played with uh, Lone Star at the time. So it was always cool, just to. Uh, looking up to them and seeing what they did to be successful and just trying to follow in their footsteps. And you had mentioned uh, you had seen one of his coolest goals. Can you describe that for us? Yeah. So uh, he was playing as like a nine at the time and uh, like the outside midfielder like played in a ball on the ground and Kakuta like as the ball came in, flicked it over a player who tried to slide tackle him. And then like as the ball was coming down, he like faked the shot and got another defender to slide and then just like tucked it in calmly in the bottom corner. And I just remember watching, I was just like, Oh man, that was crazy. <laughs> so uh, yeah, I don't think I'll ever forget that. Uh, sometimes uh, I still play it through in my mind. So it was, it was a pretty cool goal just to, to see. And you knew right then that the two of you would one day be playing for a, uh, an MLS team in Austin. <laughs> <laughs> Um, I wanted to ask you just exactly about that, though. So being born and raised in a city and then to be playing for that team's uh, MLS team is, has got to be a special feeling. Now that you have accomplished that goal, what, is, what does that mean to you? Yeah, um, it's awesome. It's a dream come true in, in uh, many ways. Uh, it's really cool just like playing and representing the city that you grew up in first and foremost but uh it's also cool having the opportunity just to play in front of my parents which I haven't done since I was an academy player and playing in front of like tons of friends and uh extended family it's really cool so uh yeah anytime I'm out there it obviously gives me extra incentive just to go out there and to perform and to really give everything for the badge you know along those lines you've definitely had uh, an up close seat to watching the soccer culture in this city grow. Um, sure. I'm, I'm curious just like how you've seen it evolve from your time playing for the Lone Star Academy to the support and momentum that I'm sure you saw uh, when Austin FC was being built. Right. So uh, I think Austin's always been a city, at least when I was growing up, uh, that had a lot of potential for soccer. Um, and to now see a city that's embraced soccer fully is really cool. So um, there have been other experiments, obviously, with Austin Aztecs. There's been Austin Bold, but nothing at the MLS level. So for Austin FC to come around and for us to get 20,000 supporters every single game for the stadium to be packed and for the fans to be jumping and singing all game, it's, it's pretty surreal. So, I mean, Austin's done a great job, obviously, of welcoming Austin FC to the scene and to, to support them fully. So it's really, really cool to see. So you you had been training with the team like uh, leading into that t uh, that Tigres match, but you weren't officially assigned on to this the senior team by that point. Can you just take right. us through that that through that process of you know what it was like to train with them? And then I heard you actually you know you performed pretty well in the trainings, which is kind of what led to you um, getting the opportunity and eventually getting signed. Right. So uh, before the Tigres game, I'd actually been with the team all of one day. So. Uh, 
I showed up and uh, I had a, a training session. Uh, things went really well. And uh, Josh came up to me afterwards. He's just like, hey, it could be something where we throw you in for five or 10 minutes at the end. What do you think about that? And I was just like, yeah, of course, I'm, I'm all for it. So uh, uh, in the Tigres game, I, I feel like I kind of got a, a sneak peek of what's to come. So it was really cool. I kind of made the joke with my parents, like it was a high school reunion out there, just seeing so many familiar <laughs> faces in the crowd. So it was really, really cool. What did you do in that training that, uh, yeah. you know, impressed him so much? Like, like take us through that experience because you must have uh, made a pretty good impression. Sure. Uh, I don't know. Obviously, it's like a footballer, or anybody in a profession for that matter. You just have days where things go right for you. So it was one of those days. And uh, I was lucky enough to score a few goals. And then uh, things kind of went my way. Obviously, we didn't have a ton of numbers uh, heading into the Tigris game. So it's just like, hey. Uh, we don't have a, a ton of options. Uh, would you be open to sitting on the bench tomorrow? I know that um, there's obviously nothing set in stone between us, uh, like contract wise. And I was just like, yeah, I'm, I'm all for it. Um, Any way I can help out. And uh, yeah, like I said, it was really cool just to get a sneak peek of the environment and uh, to, to help the team out uh, in that game. So it was cool. And so ever ever since then you've been kind of getting your your feet underneath you and learning the system and right. learning the style style of play in the MLS where would you say you are just in terms of being on the learning curve of all of those things which I, I'm sure is a lot being thrown at you sure um I mean I think as a football player you never stop learning you know what I mean there's always things that you can improve on but um just like tactics wise, um, it always takes a little bit of time just to get up to speed. But I mean, I feel like it's something that um, I'm growing more comfortable in just uh, my position on the field. And uh, yeah, I'm, I'm definitely making strides there and improving. Um, so you've you spent a little bit of time playing overseas. What is something that you took from those leagues and playing over there that you utilize now? Um, it's a lot of grit and it's uh, they definitely know how to grind out there uh, every day. Uh, you know that nothing's going to be gifted to you at training. You know that you're going to have to go out and work and that you start from pretty much nothing every single day. And um, I've been playing, I've played for teams that weren't always the best in the league. So uh, we really had to work and uh, to really go out and fight for what we earned on the pitch. And uh, I feel like that's something that I've kind of taken with me and something that uh, I try to, to do every, every time that I train and every time that I play. So before uh, Austin FC, as Paul mentioned, playing overseas, um, how did one thing lead to another and you wind up with Austin FC? Like, what were the circumstances that even put you on, on the coaching staff's radar? Right. So uh, I was most recently with Hanover 96 over in Germany, and uh, it was a, a situation where my contract expired. And I was just like, hey, I'm just going to explore all my options now. So uh uh, I trained with a, another MLS team, and then uh, I was back home, obviously, being born and raised in Austin, so I was here, and then uh, it was thrown out, like, hey, what do you think about Austin FC? And I was just like, yeah, I'd, I'd love to explore that option. So uh, I came out, and I trained, and uh, like we mentioned before, I got thrown into the Tigres game, and uh, it was just, uh, yeah, it was a really interesting option for me just from the start, so uh, I'm really happy to be here, obviously. It seemed like all the stars kind of aligned and, and just opportunity was born um, for you. That's, just, that's exactly how I feel, yeah. That's awesome. Um, you good? I'm ready to go to rapid fire. Are you? You wanted to ask yep. me anything else? All right, so all Mackenzie, Mackenzie uh, unfortunately, another one of our co-hosts of this podcast, Brittany Flowers, doesn't have ever heard of her. Um, she typically does this segment. Um, okay. As the cultural fun reporter, um, we are going to ask you a bunch of rapid fire questions. Um, they are the hardest questions, obviously, that you're going to get this entire time. Um, oh, but uh, yeah, so are you ready? Yeah, let's get it. Right off the top, Whataburger or In-N-Out? Oh, gosh, I got to rep Texas and go Whataburger. See, I, 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 I kind of teed that one up. Um, if you could have any superpower, what superpower would you want? Um, time control. Ooh, that's interesting. That hasn't been said yet. I yeah. feel like that. I feel like that would be very helpful on, on a soccer field. <laughs> yeah, probably. <laughs> yeah. Um, if, if you could uh, go anywhere in Austin, where would you go? Like, where, what do you do for fun? Um, 
Oh, that's a great question. Uh, I like my parents' house. It's a cool place to be. But uh, just uh, we'll we'll go with Zilk or we'll lock that we'll lock that in. It's a lot of fun stuff to do out there. Got okay. blue. Obviously, you could chill with your friends out there. It's a cool spot. Yeah, cool. Nice. Um, what's your favorite type of music? Uh, hip hop. Okay. What's your favorite artist? Isaiah Rashad. Just dropped a new album, by the way. Oh, there you go. I'm not yeah. a big music. Jake, are, are you privy? I don't, I'm not a big music person. I, I, I like hip hop. Uh, where, where is he from? Because I've never uh, heard of him. He's out in, he was, he's based in, uh, he's from Chattanooga, Tennessee, but uh, okay. he's based in California now. He's with the to- uh, Kendrick's label. Oh, really? Okay. I'll need yeah. to check him out then. Do it. He's awesome. Um, what is your most memorable goal of your, uh, of your career thus far? What's your favorite goal that you can think of? Uh, I'd probably say my first goal that I scored with Sonnen off Gross Ausbach. Uh, it was to win the game. We won one nothing. And, uh, yeah, it was uh, a celebration. Like I slid on my knees and then all my teammates came around and, uh, kind of just like jumped on me. So it was a really cool goal. I'd probably say that one. Piggybacking off of that. Do you have a go-to celebration? Uh... Is it the knee slide or is it something different? We can go for a knee slide here and there. Uh, I don't <laughs> think that I have a go-to celebration. Maybe that's something that I got to develop. Um, if you're thrown into a dance circle, do you have a go-to dance move? Oh, gosh, no. I'd probably just, like, stand around awkwardly and watch everybody. <laughs> <laughs> do, you, do you sing or, or do you have, like, a go-to karaoke song? Uh, I'm not very musically gifted. Um, go-to karaoke song? Uh, we were out in Vegas, me and a few friends, and we were singing like "I Got a Feeling." So uh, we'll we'll go with that, Black Eyed Peas. Okay. Um, what's some other ones that Brittany asked? Um, uh, here here's one for you. If uh, if people could be assigned yellow cards and red cards thanks. in real life, what <laughs> would you what would you hand out yellow and red cards for? Um. Hmm. It's a good question. Uh, trying to talk to somebody with headphones in is probably a, a direct red card. You can get oh, sent wow. off one. Okay. Um, I don't know. Just like being rude to people, I guess. It's just like a, a yellow card. Don't want to take too many of those. Uh, <laughs> don't really have anything else off the top of the head. That's kind of a random question. Yeah. Uh, so, I mean, are, is that like a pet peeve of yours that when you, when you have your headphones in and people are trying to talk to you? Yeah, I don't feel like anybody really likes that. You know what I mean? I don't like that. I think what I like even worse is like when someone is is sitting there watching a video without headphones in. Ah, that's super like, loud. Also, that's also yeah, right. That's yeah. a. Do you see that at the gym, Jake? Is that where is that why you're complaining about it? Uh, I mean, I most recently saw that at the airport, like people sitting around waiting for their flights and and just sitting there watching videos. I'm like, mm, it's a big no no. <laughs> it's, ridic- it's ridiculous. <laughs> uh, if, if you could shrink any animal and keep it as a pet, what well, what animal would that be? Um, hmm, maybe like an elephant or like a tiger, something like that. Yeah. Something that's just like incredibly big. Maybe like a giraffe. I think giraffes are. <laughs> that's what I'm, yeah, maybe like a dog-sized giraffe. That'd be cool. A dog. Yeah. There you go. <laughs> um, what's your favorite movie? Um, hmm. uh, Pursuit of Happiness, maybe, or Wolf of Wall Street, one of the two. Okay. Going further, what's your favorite sports movie? Uh, you remember Kicking and Screaming with Will Ferrell? Yeah, yeah I, I, grew up, I grew up with that movie, so definitely that one. Very fitting that it's a soccer movie. Yeah. Um, do you have a favorite, like, actor or, or anything like that, actress? Uh, I enjoy Leo DiCaprio's work, uh, Will Smith. Uh, I'd probably say those are the, the two that I enjoy watching the most. Uh, okay. Cillian Murphy from uh, Peaky Blinders. You guys know him yep. for that yep. show. I know of the show. My fiance loves Peaky Blinders, but I don't okay. know him. He's uh, awesome, too. What was his name again? Uh, Cillian Murphy. Okay, I'm going to ask her after this, after this podcast and see. Yeah, I hope I'm not butchering his name. <laughs> <laughs> So. do you have any more jake i i mean it's the one that Brittany always uh ends with yeah go for it and while we're on the topic of wolf of wall street i guess uh yeah 
this is this is a this is a Britney request, so we can't let her down. In your okay. best Matthew McConaughey impression, can you say "All right, all right, all right"? All right, all right, all right. There you go. <laughs> from uh, from the the Austin native, from no, from one Austin native to an Austin superstar, we appreciate that. <laughs> there you go, uh, Mackenzie. We appreciate you joining us on the podcast. Um, Hope you have a great one. Thank you. Thank you for having me. Y'all yeah, take care. Sure. You too. Well, we appreciate Mackenzie Gaines joining us there. Um, I want to quickly um, move forward to the Austin, the next match, Austin FC versus Real Salt Lake that's coming up uh, on Saturday. Um, that's another road match. And then after that, they'll have three straight home games again. Um, Austin. Austin's back half of the schedule is very home loaded because the front half, uh, because of the stadium not being open, was um, we had our obviously the eight straight road games. Um, and the fit, this I wanted to quickly mention that the schedule for Austin FC moving forward is very favorable um, in the sense that five of the next six opponents are all non playoff teams, and the sixth, uh, the, the lone one out is Portland, um, who Austin FC did beat 4 1 at home, and they're on the bubble. So, I mean, all very winnable, winnable games um, from that perspective. Um, Real Salt Lake has lost two of its last three home matches against expansion sides. So that's another um, good thing for uh, the history of uh, Austin playing Real Salt Lake for the first time. And uh, they have lost only one of the first 10 matches against expansion sides at home. So um, moving forward, you know, Real Salt Lake's right there right below that they're in the eighth spot, 21 points. Um, one of the many teams that Austin will be looking to, um, they're fight, They're all fighting for the same thing. They're yeah. on, the, on the outside looking in. So. Yeah. I think uh, your point just underscores the fact that uh, these next few games are very winnable games for Austin FC. And I think they're happening at a good time when it feels like, the club is finally starting to take steps to getting to full strength and addressing the needs that have plagued them for quite a few months now. You would also hope, given the fact that Austin FC is playing a bunch of teams that uh, are outside of the playoff picture, you hope that also means that some of the teams in the playoff picture are beating up on each other during this time um, and, and causing you know each other not to accumulate the points, which would allow Austin FC to get back into the playoff picture. Mm-hmm. Um, yeah, I think, I think Mike Craven of the Statesman said, um, you know, 18 points in these next six matches or so is obviously the goal. Cause that would mean three points per match, but 12 points in these six matches would get them within a, a you know, striking distance of a playoff spot and no within cracking. Intended. Yeah. That, that playoff picture. Um, so We'll, we'll see what happens. Um, as you mentioned, Real Salt Lake has lost two in a row. Austin FC, though, hasn't won a road game uh, since the end of May. No, since the start of May, since May 1st. Um, yeah. They haven't left the state of Texas since the end of June. So the schedule has been very favorable. This is, uh, this is going to be a challenge um, yeah. just because it's, it's a road trip for the first time in a while. It's hopping on a plane for the first time in a while. Um, we'll see what happens. We are halfway through the regular season officially. So this is where you got to make your move. If you're Austin FC, um, again, as I said earlier in the podcast, nothing would surprise me. Uh, you know, (laughs) a a totally lackluster performance wouldn't surprise me. Them scoring four goals and boat racing, uh, Salt Lake would not (laughs) surprise me. (laughs) So we'll see. You just got to strap in and just stick along for the ride. Um, yeah. It really quick, uh, it, it, just to kind of put a number on the scoring problems that Austin FC has had. Um, like we've talked about it a lot, but I don't know that we've necessarily, you know, pinpointed how deep of an issue it. Like this is has, has been like historically bad. Mm-hmm. Uh, the fact that they've been shut out eleven times through seventeen games is tied <laughs> for the worst in MLS history. So the league's been around since 1996 and only (laughs) two other times has a team been shut out this many times through 17 games. So it's not been great. um, But again, like 
when they have scored, we've seen glimpses of what the finished product will look like. And uh, for all the fans out there who, who live and breathe and exist based on the success of this team, you would hope that they can find uh, more consistency going forward. I agree with that. And also I kind of think it highlights um, because I mean, from an offensive standpoint, like you said, it's, it's one of it's tied for the worst, you know, start in the league's history, but yet they're still within striking distance of the playoffs because of the fact that the defense has played so well. Um, And so, I mean, part of it has been um, Stuber playing at an all-star level, even though he was a snub, um, but there, oh, we didn't the, even talk about that. <laughs> oh, yeah, you're right. Oh, goodness. Don't even, well, I, don't even get me started. Yeah, no, me, and, I, me, and, me and Brady talked about it, but me and you haven't talked about it. On a podcast you have? Uh, I believe, or no, I, no, not the all-star thing, but the thing that I'm thinking of is we talked about um, the fact that he's being a beast and that he should be an all-star. Yeah. Um, but that was a wild thing when that all-star list came out and Stuber was not he was the only one that I realistically kind of expected um yeah but I can't remember I can't remember who it was I I want to say maybe it was like another MLS goalkeeper uh but like tweeted at him like hey your work hasn't gone unnoticed this year Mm -hmm. keep ball keep balling or something like that so I thought that was pretty cool I think I think uh the fans at Q2 Whenever he makes a save, instead of chanting "stew," uh, should go going forward chant uh, "snubbed." There you go. I I, I appreciate that because I mean he was like I told I don't know where the stats are at now um, because it's been like a, a week and a half since I did it, but um, at the time um, I was talking to Brittany about the fact that Brad is the only keeper in the like. So, I mean, he obviously leads the league in saves, which is I mean, you don't want that because that means your goal, your goal is getting peppered. But also, yeah. um, to couple that, like you're getting, you're, he's seeing a lot of shots, but he's saving a huge percentage of them. Which, like from an analytics standpoint, that just shows to me like how much of a beast he's been. Um, and it was like he was the he was the only goalkeeper in the league with like more than twenty saves that had an eighty percent percentage, like. Everyone else that was at the top of the league in saves, I think at the time it was he had like 56 or something. Um, and it was like the second, third, fourth, fifth, it was like, you know, 51, 48, 47, 46, like that kind of thing. But they yeah. all, but they all had like 60 something percent save percentage. And so he was like head and shoulders above the efficiency standpoint of the like higher, you know, total save keepers in the league. And the only other person in the entire league that had above 80% was uh, Seattle's goalie. And he only has 17 saves because he doesn't see any shots. Yep. So yep. I was just, I was taken aback and, you know, it, everyone on Twitter everywhere was, you know, yelling his praises and, you know, he needs to be an all-star, which I, I will also advocate for that. But, you know, all-star games in, in every sport is a popularity contest. Um, I mean, there's a certain amount of, you know, individual performance that goes into it. Um, but you see it in the NBA, like it doesn't like LeBron could, you know, have a really crappy season by his standards and he would get voted in no matter what, you know. And so yep. same thing with Pro Bowls and football. Um, so, <laughs> you know, <laughs> quick little laugh on the Pro Bowl. Yeah, I can't tell you the last time I watched the Pro Bowl, I'll be honest. That's the that's the worst pro sports all-star game in the game. Uh just ridiculously awful. <laughs> yeah. All right. So uh, um let's uh move forward to a uh, real quick update before we get out of here. Um ABCFC update. Um uh, I'll let you handle that as, yeah. the, as the captain of the team. Um you know, I, I said before the game, uh, I stole a quote from To Kill a, Mark, to Kill a Mockingbird, and uh, that quote was talking about uh, what real courage is, and, and the quote goes, real courage is knowing you're licked before you begin, but you, be, but you begin anyway and you see it through no matter what. There you go. 
And, and that's what we did. Um, we knew we were licked, um, which, which some people on social media had no idea what that meant. And I, th- I mean, maybe it's old school English, but it essentially means when you're behind the eight ball before you start, when, when you know you're uh, going to get boat race before you start, but you start anyway and you see it through because uh, it's what it's what you do. It's the right thing to do. So we took the field without a large contingent of our starting lineup, without, you know, our Alex ring of the field and Brittany Flowers. And, uh, you know, we got boat raced. What was it? Five nothing, the final score. Uh, and it never felt that close. Um, but as Brittany once said, we don't lose, we learn. And we- so excited to update you guys on the result <laughs> of, of game three <laughs> oh, next week. All right. So uh, that'll do it for us on the podcast. Thanks for watching this episode of Verde View, uh, KVU's Austin FC podcast. To get all your Austin FC content, you can go to kvu.com slash Austin FC or by texting the word soccer to 512-459-9442. And even though Brittany is not here, you can still text her and she'll respond with yes, please. Um, that'll do it for us. And we're going to hit you with the old John Gallagher sign off.